Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Liora Bielski. I am a law professor here in Tel Aviv University and the head of the Minerva Center for Human Rights. And I will be uh, uh, the chair of this really, really interesting panel, uh, which called the consequences of compensation for individual claimants. And uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce uh, each uh, uh, panelist as they uh, come along. We'll hear the, um, we'll hear the lectures one after the other, and then we will open for Q and A. So the first, uh, uh, the first panelist is Dr. Iris Nahum. She is an associate professor of modern European history at Hebrew, sorry, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where she also serves as deputy director of the Jacob Robinson Institute for the history of individual and collective rights. Her research explores the interactions between demands, practices, and discourses of compensation in the intra-German, German-Israeli, and German-Jewish contexts. The topic of her current project is compensation claim under the West German Equalization of Burdens Law. In 2023 and 2024, she will be she will co-organize with Professor Gidon Reuveni and Daniel Simmons a research group on the globalization of Wieden Gutmach <laughs> yes, at the Israel uh, Institute for Advanced Studies. And I am very proud to be part of this group. So uh, 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 Iris uh, will give us the first talk, which is Complica Complicated Encounters, Jewish Claimants and the German Legal Categories. Please. Thank you, Leora. The following presentation is based on a research project which I'm currently conducting with Professor Jose Bruno. Thanks to you to our research assistant, Asaf Doron, for helping us in identifying and collecting documents at the Central Archives in Jerusalem. Recently, Asaf found a document that surprised us. The document is a letter written in 1985 by Walter Schwarz. Schwarz was a German Jewish lawyer and brilliant expert of compensation. Usually, Schwarz is referred to as enthusiastic proponent of Wiedergutmachung. Indeed, he famously concluded one of his publications with the lines, I think a German has the right, has the right to be proud of Wiedergutmachung. In light of this, Jose and I were stunned to read in the archive letter about Schwarz's strong criticism against certain aspects of Wiedergutmachung. Schwarz had addressed the letter to Ernst Katzenstein, the long-term representative of the claims conference in Germany. In the letter, Schwarz expressed his anger and frustration as follows. Die Eindeutschung der Juden aus Osteuropa zu Zwecken der Wiedergutmachung war eine Farce. The Germanization of the Jews from Eastern Europe for the purpose of Wiedergutmachung was a farce. Later on in the document, Schwarz called the Germanization of Eastern European Jews, quote, the worst legislative mistake in the field of Wiedergutmachung, unquote. But was this the case? Was Schwarz right in calling the Germanization of the Jews a farce? Was he right in stating that it was the worst legislative mistake in the field of Wiedergutmachung? The aim of my presentation is to answer these questions. In doing so, I will explore the method that turned some Eastern European Jews into Germans for the purpose of compensation. As mentioned before, Schwarz wrote the letter to Katzenstein in the year 1985. 
Schwarz, Katzenstein and other compensation activists were thus preoccupied with this topic in a quite advanced stage of the implementation of the Luxembourg Agreement. Thus, the second aim of my presentation is to explore the long durée of the method that made, or at least tried to make, Germans out of Eastern European Jews. But what did Schwarz actually mean when speaking of the Germanization of the Jews from Eastern Europe for the purpose of Wiedergutmachung? The answer to this question leads us straight to the protocols signed between West Germany and the Claims Conference in Luxembourg in 1952. According to protocol number one, persons who were persecuted because of their political convictions, race, faith, or ideology, and who settled in the Federal Republic or emigrated abroad from expulsion errors within the meaning of that term in the, in the equalization of burdens law, shall receive compensation. This applies, however, only if it may be assumed that the persecutee would have been subjected to the expulsion measures taken against German nationals and ethnic Germans in, accord in connection with the events of the Second World War. These are hardly understandable passages, also in the German version of the text. As you probably know, these passages are the result of a bizarre compromise reached reach between the West German delegation and the claims conference during the negotiations in Wassenaar. In Wassenaar, the Germans rejected the claims conference's demand to compensate all Holocaust survivors from Central and Eastern Europe who had settled in the West after the war. As Nehemia Robinson, a member of the Jewish negotiating team and a topic of Ronald Zweig's presentation yesterday, wrote to one of his colleagues in the summer of 1952, you must realize that we are in no position to impose our will upon the Germans. End of quote. Nevertheless, the German negotiating team came to agree to compensate Jews of German background who had originated in the so-called expulsion eras. Please note the conditional and hypothetical wording of the sentence. If it may be assumed and would have been subjected to. This is a legal construction. It aims at Jewish victims of Nazism who had lived in Central and Eastern Europe, the later expulsion eras, and had identified with Germanness before the war. The legal construction rests on the assumption that after 1945, these Jews would have been expelled from their homes in Central Europe because of their German identity, if they had not already been forcibly removed from their homes because of their Jewish identity. In other words, this legal fiction regards Eastern European Jews of German background as potential expellees, as quasi expellees. And for this reason, this group of people came to be called fictional expellees. Fictional expellees were granted the right to claim compensation under two different West German laws. First, under the BEG, the Federal Compensation Law, they could demand compensation for damages to life, health, freedom, and career. And second, under the Equalization of Burdens Law, the Lastenausgleichsgesetz, which is explicitly mentioned in the protocol here, they could claim compensation for Holocaust-related damages to property. We commemorate in this conference the 17th anniversary of the Luxembourg Agreement. But let's not forget the twin sister, or more precisely, the half-sister of the agreement, namely the Equalization of Burdens Law, 
which came into the world in August 1952. The law was implemented to compensate ethnic Germans, the real expellees, for their expulsion-related damages to property. And we will hear more about this law in Ingo Lohse's presentation tomorrow. As just shown, in accordance with protocol number one, also fictional expellees were granted the right to claim compensation under the Equalization of Burdens Law, namely compensation for Holocaust-related damages to property. Archive documents indicate that in Vassena, virtually no discussions took place between the Germans and the Claims Conference on the practical consequences of creating fictional expellees. Indeed, no discussions took place on the practical meaning of linking the fate of ethnic German expellees, Volksdeutsche Vertriebene, to Holocaust survivors of German background, their former neighbors, so to speak. The fact that these aspects were not debated is quite astonishing, since these passages from the protocol affected not only thousands of Holocaust survivors, they also resulted in a huge German bureaucracy built to verify, confirm, and reject German identity markers of Jewish compensation claimants under the BEG and under the Equalization of Burdens Law. I will say more about that later in the paper. Actually, it seems then when, that when signing the protocol, the German negotiators and the claims conference had two different groups of people in mind. The German side intended to compensate primarily German Jews from the former Eastern territories of Germany. The German Jewish lawyer from Breslau, the German Jewish teacher from Königsberg, the German Jewish merchant from Danzig. In short, the German negotiators envisioned Jews who, in the past, had belonged to Germany and to the German nation. The Claims Conference, however, thought about just any Jew from Eastern Europe who happened to speak German and to read Goethe and Schiller. This misunderstanding between the two negotiating teams evolved quickly into a profound conflict that shaped the relationship between German bureaucracy and Jewish compensation activists in the following decades. Basically, the conflict centered around the question of who is a fictional expellee. In other words, how did the German authorities determine the German identity of Holocaust survivors from expulsion errors? At this point, let me emphasize that in 1953, the Bundestag passed the so-called Bundesvertriebenengesetz, the federal expellee law. The law aimed to regulate the legal status of ethnic German expellees in West Germany, and in doing so, defined membership in the German nation. According to the law, a member of the German nation, Deutscher Volkszugehöriger, is anyone who has professed adherence to the German nation, ist zum deutschen Volkstum bekannt, in his homeland, provided that this profession, the Kenntnis, is confirmed by specific features, such as ancestry, language, upbringing, culture. In short, the law specified two requirements for membership in the German nation. First, a subjective profession to the German folk in the past. And second, objective German identity markers, such as language and culture. The same requirements were applied to Holocaust survivors of German background from Central and Eastern Europe who wished to claim compensation under the Federal Compensation Law, the BEG, and under the Equalization of Burdens Law. As already emphasized, in order to assess German identity of such claimants, the German authorities established a huge bureaucracy. The claimants living in West Germany underwent the verification process in local compensation process, in, in local compensation offices. Holocaust survivors 
living abroad underwent the process at embassies at the Federal Republic of Germany. In Israel, however, since there were no diplomatic relations between the two countries, the German-speaking staff of the Office for Personal Compensation from Abroad at the Israeli Ministry of, Affairs, uh, Ministry of Finance conducted the examination of the claimant's German identity. I would like to give you now a quick impression of the proceedings at the Office for Personal Compensation from Abroad. First, the Israeli Holocaust survivor was invited to an interview with an Israeli clerk who checked the claimant's German background. The claimant had to read and write a text in German, provide information about German reading habits, about the language spoken at home, about pre-war membership in German associations, and basically provide anything that could confirm belonging to the German nation. In one case, for instance, a claimant from Danzig brought with her to the interview her pre-war wedding menu in the German language. If the clerk was convinced of the claimant's Germanness, he sent a positive report to the authorities in Germany. However, however, if the claimant clearly failed the interview, for instance, because she could not convince the clerk that her Yiddish was in fact German, the clerk sent a negative report to Germany, and thus the claimant was denied compensation. This is a striking example of the boundaries of inclusion and exclusion that Konstantin Goschler mentioned yesterday. Yet, if the clerk was doubtful, if he was uncertain about the claimant's Germanness, the claimant underwent an additional investigation by an Israeli commission whose name must be seen to be believed. Kommission zur Feststellung der vertriebenen, Eigenschaft, vertriebenen Eigenschaft in Zweifelsfällen. Commission for the Assessment of Ex-Belief Feature in Cases of Doubt. As the name indicates, the Commission's task was to check whether claimants whose Germanness was unclear could still be considered as fictional ex -beliefs. For this purpose, the Commission checked to what extent the claimants had identified themselves before the war with German traditions, values, and habits. In one case, for instance, the Commission stressed that, quote, the fact that the claimant did not marry until the persecution witnesses the extent of his inner estrangement from the Jewish tradition and customs and personal affinity with German habits. The, commission focus, the Commission's focus on the inner world, so to say, of the claimants was crucial since the German authorities demanded not only German objective German identity markers, such as language and culture, but also pre-war subjective profession to the German nation. The members of the Commission were as strict as one could expect from a body with such a name. So they were never fully trusted by the German compensation authorities. Our research shows that they did not send a positive re evaluation report to Germany if they were not completely convinced of the claimant's German identity. As it quickly turned out, many claimants from Eastern Europe spoke German and were knowledgeable of, about Goethe and Schiller, but never had identified as belonging to the German folk. In fact, only a very specific group of Jews actually fulfilled both requirements, objective German identity markers and a pre-war subjective profession to the German nation, namely Jews from the former Eastern territories of Germany and from the Sudetenland. In other words, Jews whom the German negotiating team in Wassenaar had in mind from the beginning. Following heavy intervention by the Claims Conference in 1965, the federal German authorities in charge of PEG loosened the criteria of recognition of fictional ex -beliefs. The authorities continued to, to require a pre-war belonging to the so-called Deutsche Sprachenkulturkreis, 
the circle of German language and culture, but they dropped the requirement of subjective identification with the German folk. In doing so, the number of eligible claimants under the BEG increased substantially. And so in the long run, 13% of all payments under the BEG were paid to fictional expellees. The authorities in charge of the equalization of burdens law, however, continued to insist on the claimant's pre-war profession to the German folk, in addition to their belonging to the circle of German language and culture. Kurt May, the head of Euro, the United Restitution Organization, expressed his disappointment with this requirement with the polemical words, there must be somewhere a Max Naumann from Eastern Europe, referring to the leader of the pre-war association of German national Jews who supported Hitler and advocated for the total assimilation of Jews into the German folk. And thus, by 1967, about 17,000 Jews, Jewish claimants, were excluded from the equalization of burdens law. For years, while more and more Holocaust survivors were dying, Hans Katzenstein, the previously mentioned representative of the Claims Conference, unsuccessfully try to change the position of the equalization of burdens authority. Finally, Katzenstein had to admit, in 1952, nobody was aware of or could foresee the effects and repercussions of the equalization of burdens legislation. Otherwise, the Jewish delegation would hardly have set their name under protocol number one. I have mentioned earlier the fact that in 1965, the federal German authorities in charge of the BEG dropped the requirement of a pre-war profession to the German folk. However, as José and I have realized recently, on the local level, some BEG authorities continued to insist on the profession to the German folk, in addition to the belonging to the circle of German language and culture. Indeed, very much to the annoyance of Jewish compensation activists, some BEG authorities proceeded as restrictively as the equalization of burdens authority. Here, for instance, you can see a form from the, BEG, uh, from the BEG authority of Cologne from the year 1972. Besides asking various questions, about the languages of the claimant, Muttersprache, Umgangssprache, Sprachkenntnisse, Unterrichtssprache, and about membership in German associations, the form also explicitly asks a question about the belonging to the German folk. Womit können Sie Ihre Zugehörigkeit zum deutschen Volke nachweisen? This is a good question. Most claimants could not bring such evidence, simply because they had never professed belonging to the German folk. Very often in the 1970s and 1980s, cases like this were brought to German courts where judges often decided in favor of the Jewish claimants. So then, was Walter Schwarz right in calling the Germanization of the Jews a farce? Well, from my perspective, the answer is yes. This whole process of demanding from victims identification with the culture and nation of the perpetrators in order to be eligible to claim compensation from the perpetrators is absurd. In fact, it was one thing to bring evidence to German authorities of one's knowledge of the German language and affinity with German culture. As absurd as this proof was, many Jews from Central and Eastern Europe did feel at home at the Deutsche Sprachenkulturkreis. Yet it was another thing to demand from Holocaust survivors proof that in the past they had identified themselves as Volksdeutsche. This was seen by many as an especially outrageous demand. But was Schwarz also right in stating that the Germanization of the Jews was the worst legislative mistake in the field of Wiedergutmachung? Well, 
On this point, I do not share his opinion. I believe that it was not a mistake, since only by agreeing to the conditions of the German negotiating team in Wassenau, thus only by agreeing to the Germanization of the Jews, could the claims conference over the years succeed in enlarging the number of eligible claimants. The alternative would have been to leave many Holocaust survivors with minimal financial assistance or without any support at all. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. This was really uh, fascinating. Uh, a lot of literature is written about performing the laws and this uh, performance of the law, what it does to uh, the identity of the uh, applicant. And uh, we, we, we can discuss it later, on the, not just on the individual, but what does it do to the whole project of Nazism to exclude the Jews and now after the war, this uh, performance of inclusion into the German uh, nation. But uh, let's 